Hello, everyone. Uh, we're, we certainly hope that you've all had a great, fabulous summer and that we're all now ready to get back to our family history research. This is the September webinar presented by the Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors. My name is Linda Urquhart. I will be your host for tonight. Cindy Robichaud will be monitoring the questions. Thanks to Cindy for doing that. Before we start, we do want to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today, including the first inhabitants of Essex County, the Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwa or Chippewa, as well as the Huron or Wendat or Wyandot bands. As family historians, we look for the stories of the men and women who came before us. In doing that, we must acknowledge the mistakes of the past and consider how we can best support our local Indigenous communities. Thanks for joining us. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and it will be added to the Essex County Branch YouTube channel. Also, everyone is muted and your camera is turned off during the presentation. Questions will be answered following the presentation. Just post your questions in the chat box as we go along. The chat box can be found by hovering your mouse at the bottom of the screen, just like in that diagram. For those who are first time visitors to our webinars, we are one of the 35 branches or special interest groups of Ontario Ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society which is the largest member-supported genealogical organization in Canada. It was founded in 1961 with its mission to encourage, bring together, and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. We encourage you to visit their website where you can do a search for what they have on file about your ancestor. You can also view their monthly educational webinars and you can view their family history products, which are available in the marketplace. It's worth your while to investigate what is available there to assist you in your research. Our webinars are all via Zoom, and because of that, we have missed our in-person meetings where we could meet you and you could meet us and we could have informal chats and hear about your family research stories. Therefore, we have decided to have a meet and greet on Saturday, October 21st at the Windsor Public Library Local History Branch so that we can reconnect on a more personal level. As well, we can show you what resources we have in our collection and what the library has in its local history collection, which is vast. We'll be there from 10 a.m. until noon. Some of us plan to go for lunch at a local restaurant, and we'd love to continue our discussions there. So come and see us. Uh, I think many people have already heard this, but on Monday, September the 11th, the City of Windsor's Development and Heritage Standing Committee approved the recipients of the 2023 Built Heritage Award. The cemetery team of the Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors was recognized for their work at Windsor Grove Cemetery. The Essex Branch Cemetery team has been photographing and transcribing information on headstones and markers at Windsor Grove for the last four years. To ensure they capture as many inscriptions as possible, their work also includes cleaning headstones and unearthing buried markers. This valuable information is compiled in digital databases used by genealogy groups, family history researchers, as well as others, and serves to preserve the memory of those memorialized by the stones. The award represents the preservation of local heritage and will be presented at City Council, tentatively scheduled for October the 16th. We are also pleased to be able to introduce you to the very interesting webinars that the Essex branch will be offering in the coming months of 2023. In October, Lori Brett will introduce her book, The Rising Village, An Early History of Essex. 
And in November, Ken McKinley will offer his tips on researching World War I soldiers. You can register for these webinars on our webpage or on the Essex Branch Facebook group. If you're not a member of the Facebook group yet, just search for Essex Branch OGS and you'll find us. Tonight's webinar is being presented by Tom Koch, the historian at the Jack Miners Sanctuary. I'm sure that those of you who live in Essex County have visited there. My parents took me to Jack Miners many times and my husband and I have taken our children as well as our grandchildren there. It's been really a local um, treat to be able to go there. So Tom's going to be discussing the history of the minor family as well as the sanctuary itself. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that Tom can take over. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Cindy and Linda, for everything. If my voice sounds a little bit off, um, six days ago, I had my second bout of COVID-19. So oh. this is... Um, this is something that uh, obviously you can't plan for, but we are going to get through it together and uh, just have a good time. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to everybody um, about uh, about Jack's story and about the sanctuary. And um, like uh, like Linda said, everybody who uh, you know, most people who grew up in in the in the county, you know, knows of Jack, knows of the sanctuary. So I'll. Uh, I'll begin, um, I have a very short presentation, a very short slideshow talking about the sanctuary today. So what we'll do is we'll start there and then um, I'll kind of give you some some context so then we'll get into you know more of Jack's linear um, story. And I, and I do wanna make one correction. I'm actually not the historian, I'm actually the executive director. And what that means, it's a little different. And not only do I, I manage staff, but I work in the museum. So again, I, I, I help with tours. I'm uh, I'm I'm helping doing that. I, I manage the staff. I write grants. I head up all of the events. I am I do the social media and the marketing. So as my dad refers to it, um, I'm the uh, the 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 chief cook and the bottle washer. So that's basically a general generic term of executive director. And um, again, I'm just I'm so happy to be here. And uh, let's just get going here. So I'm going to just quickly share share my screen but I can't, so that's okay. No big deal. Hey, hey, hey Tom, it's Cindy here. I'm not sure what's happening, but your camera is kind of like bouncing. It's making, it's, it oh. is, uh, I don't know if it's your, you're touching the desk or your camera or something, but. Just gonna set up here, hang on. <laughs> Let me just do some tweaking. It's like, it's like the, you're on waves. <laughs> the joys of technology. Better. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, and we lost you. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Thank you so much. Is that better? Again, yeah, thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate okay. that. So, yeah. so, um, so where we are, the sanctuary today, um, the the Jack Miner Migratory Bird Foundation is founded by Jack back in 1904, and it's dedicated to the conservation legacy of Jack Miner. And how we do that is it's through the feeding, protection, defense, and tracking of migratory waterfowl. So while we do that, we also provide a um, a, a no charge natural education and heritage environment for the benefit and enjoyment of future and current generations. Our goal is to make a san the sanctuary a tourist uh, destination for all. Um, I'll definitely get into the history here uh, very quickly. Um, so we have a staff, a very dedicated but very small staff of uh, six people, uh, myself as executive director. Our Director of Education and Community Engagement, Matt Oleski, he oversees uh, tour bookings, he oversees our educational programming, um, he helps, uh, you know, connect with, with different organizations like yours, if you guys ever want to come and, and do a tour or even have an in-person meeting, you know, Matt would be the person to coordinate that. Uh, Joe, Joe Vermeulen's been our ground superintendent for the last 35 years, he was actually hired out of high school by Jack's son, Jasper. Um, his son, we we work with Chase of Remulin part time as an ex, as an assistant groundskeeper, and then we have two additional uh, staff people as well um, in that part time setting. So um, 
our current vision for the sanctuary is we're, we're our working tagline is really thinking beyond the goose. So while the migratory waterfowl is still important, you know, being able to educate folks on geese, on ducks, on on a lot of these migratory birds, where where we're moving forward is is into the educational component and and specifically uh, the reintroduction of uh, educational based field trips. Um, there's a there's a whole generation of people who. Um, there's about a 20 year gap where, um, you know, I'm in my forties as a kid, I grew up, it was about a grade six or grade seven trip. You went to Jack Minor. Um, so there's a whole generation of folks because what happened is the provincial government made it, uh, made field trips tie into the curriculum. And if the field trip didn't have, um, if it couldn't relate back to the curriculum, you couldn't go. So that uh, lost the sanctuary. An entire generation of folks just don't know what it is or don't know who it is or don't know, well, who is Jack Miner? Um, so what we've done is in, in order to curb this is uh, we've actually built educational-based curriculum. So we actually have lesson plans, rubrics, um, educational-based programming that we can take out to the schools um, K through eight. We launched it earlier this year, and uh, we saw in April the reintroduction of uh, of uh, class trips. So not only is it coming to Jack Miners to, um, you know, learn about these birds, learn about Jack's history, but also learn about, you know, what's in our soil, what's in our water, uh, what are some different, how do you identify what type of trees um, we have, and really just allowing folks and allowing kids to learn about our ecosystem, and and most importantly. Um, let them understand um, really the point of learning about our ecosystem is to understand how they relate and how their actions can impact our ecosystem. Um, and uh, by doing that, we're really reintroducing and, and living up to that conservational legacy that uh, that Jack has. So, so we are focusing our efforts and telling our stories, showcasing everything that we have going on here. Uh, we look for new ways to bring people into the sanctuary. Back in June, we hosted uh, the Kingsville Highland Games, uh, which was you know very successful. And we're also looking to develop new partnerships and, and do things that uh, the sanctuary hasn't done uh, in quite a while. For example, having a Zoom call in, in a beautiful September evening with uh, with uh, with you guys. So we're, we're looking to always look to develop those new partnerships and concentrate on really just leveling up everything that we do. So so with that being said, I'm going to jump into, um, you know, Jack's linear story uh, where I'm going to spend some time talking about that. And then, um, Cindy, did we decide, are we going to do questions at the end? Did we want to interrupt? I, I totally forget where we were with that. Um, so if somebody has a question that's pertinent to something you're talking about, I can, you know, definitely jump on and ask the question. And then if it's something more general, we can just leave it to the end. Perfect. Is that, okay. Is that okay with you? That's perfect. I, again, okay. I, I, I tend to have more these, uh, I, I try to keep these, uh, you know these talks as uh, as interesting as possible. I don't want to bore bore people with with a, a lot of stuff. So I, I like to do more conversational um, uh, approaches, and I I kind of just look at it like like that. So okay. Um. So yeah. So we'll begin. Um. So John Miner. Uh, Jack's uh, real name is actually John. He's named after his dad. Um. Jack was born in Dover City, or sorry, Dover Center, Iowa, in 1865. Uh, he was the fifth of ten children. Uh, fifth of 10 kids born to John and Anne Miner, who had originally emigrated uh, from England. Um, right away, Jack's biggest supporter um, truly, truly was his mom. Um, his mom saw Jack, you know, light up anytime Jack was outside um, in nature, in the fields. And she really understood that um, she realized pretty early on she was going to lose Jack um, to a sense of formal education. However, she knew that the lessons that he learned in the woods is, is going to um, be important and be impactful to him in uh, in in uh, throughout uh, many years. So, um, so we'll fast forward in 1876. Um, a depression hit the U.S. and um, before the 1930, uh, before the Great Depression, that was actually known. The 1870 depression was actually known as the Depression. And it, it specifically hit out the state of Ohio where they lived uh, very hard. Um, so hard, in fact, that between 1870 and 1878, the Miner family um, actually moved six times. 
And uh, in 1877, uh, they made their plans to move north um, over the border to Canada uh, because uh, Mrs. Miner's uh, family, uh, Anne's family, uh, the Broadwells had actually settled near near Kingsville. Um, prospects just, again, seemed better there. And, um, you know, more traditional, more conservative, um, you know, quote unquote, English folks um, were, uh, you know, were welcome. So in uh, on April 22nd, 1878, the family loaded themselves up. Uh, again, we take this for for granted now, but to uh, to to drive to uh, Dover Center, which is now Westlake, Ohio, it's it's about a two and a half to three hour drive. But back on uh, April 22nd, 1878, uh, the trip was actually a day and a half. And um, Jack's Jack's dad mentioned to him as they left. Um, you know, we're going to make more than just a living. We're actually, we're going to Canada to make a life. So when they arrived to Essex County, land was super cheap. Uh, and, um, but unfortunately, right away, you know, they had dire straits as, as the, the minor family dealt with really hot, wet summers. Um, the land was constantly flooded with flies, large volumes of mosquitoes, and uh, really forced to deal with the elements Um John, his dad, Jack, and his uh, close brother, Ted, uh, they started um, ditching and started to try to develop some sort of uh, of water system to basically deal with, uh, with these critters. And within a week of uh, hand digging, they had six acres of land cleared. Uh, from there, they began the process to uh, prep for planting. So um, they moved up in April. So by August of that same year, um, the homestead had actually undergone a complete transformation as the locals uh, throughout Kingsville and, and the county, you know, flocked. And again, I love to use bird puns. So you're going to hear a couple flocked is definitely one of my first ones. And uh, folks had to take a gander. See, there's my second bird pun um, to the minor house because the locals wanted to see all of the beautiful flowers that Anne um, and planted and they they needed to see those those uh, the beautiful plants that those Yankees got that that is the quote well, Tom Tom a yes. question right there um, was that first location where the sanctuary is now is it still the same place or did they move again when they first landed great question it is um, how I basically it is right there it's it's the overall layout of of the house is a little different the the jack minor house where it is now that's not where the original homestead was um the original homestead was was kind of almost parallel to where the current structure is i don't know how familiar you guys are with with um with with that but the the sanctuary today has 480 acres and in those days um, I think it was probably close to about 70 or 80 that they had. So over the years they've expanded. However, um, where where they where they settled is pretty close to where the house is now. But we're we're talking uh it would have been a good maybe 30 or 40 feet to the west or to the east of, of where it is now. So okay, but good. that's that's a great great question. So um yeah, so so essentially, um, as winter came, um, Jack turned to market hunting. Um, his skills, you know, quickly grew. Um, he uh, attracted uh, John John Mallet, the the local mayor. They did a, a number of of hunts, um, and you know, the, the legend and the local kind of buzz of Jack grew throughout throughout the area. As somebody who, you know, was a trusted hunter was. You know, and again, because of his knowledge of of nature and and of the woods, um, he he transitioned, um, you know, throughout the mid eighteen eighties, you know, from that market hunter to that sports hunter, and um, what had happened in, in that time is is um, the miner family, you know, began to realize that hey, they're actually on a really good bed of tile and and brick, and um, pre sanctuary, and even back when they lived in Ohio. Uh, the minor family actually made their money uh, in 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 brick and tile, and um, there is a story that um, Jack's Jack's uh, parents gave him a choice. He was he was five, you know. You go to school, or you go to work. What do you want to do, Jack? And they're like, I'm going to work. So his job, and again, this was before kiln dry drying. So he, Jack had to go as a kid and actually turn every 
single brick as it was drying in the sun. So I always, I always, uh, you know, enjoyed, uh, in, enjoyed that story. Um, Jack as a person, you know, as a super sincere, super honest man, you know, his, his philosophies were all about hard work, common sense, and a deep love of nature and uh, hum, hum, humility and humanity. Um, right around the, this time of the 1880s, um, there was kind of a, an awakening with conservation with Roosevelt, you know, coming on onto the uh, the forefront, and there's an an I this idea of conservation and this realization that hey, um, market hunting is actually doing more harm and good, and sure. Sure, market hunting is, is important. Not only is it providing food, it's providing, um, you know, resources for people who who need it. But there's this idea that, like, maybe these resources, maybe these these animals that we're killing, they actually there actually may not be an, an infinite amount of them. So, you know, we have to understand that these resources aren't an endless bounty, and unless um, something actually happens. We need to really take action for this. Um, you know, it could, it could be trouble. Um, so Jack started this, this transition in, in the 1880s and it, it really is important because, and again, if, if questions do come up, we can talk about how hunting, uh, plays a role in conservation, um, because it is of, you know, extreme importance and, and it is a very, um, a necessary component of conservation but what made jack unique um was really his ability to connect the spiritual side of conservation um, and wildlife preservation he looked at the bond that a person has um, with that natural world and looked to create linkages to create those connections between himself between the goose and between the grass that that goose uh, ate um so not only was he really great at communicating this, communicating, you know, um, this vision that he had for the, for the world, for the ecosystem, for our environment, but also try to uh, inspire others to, to join that cause. So between 1886 and 1905, um, Jack really transitioned. This was a huge tr transi transition period for him. Um, and um, he really went from market hunter to conservationist. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, and it's essentially, um, I did, I did mention, so I'm kind of jumping around here. Um, so essentially by the time Jack was 17, Jack and his brother, Ted did start their own, uh, brick making business at, at the current grounds, uh, by, at 1884. Then by 1886, um, Jack and Ted went to a local Sunday evening, uh, revival meeting, where Jack met uh, Leona Weigel, a daughter of a prosperous Kingsville couple. And uh, Christmas Eve, 1888, uh, they were married. And then um, Jack moved in. Um, Jack essentially moved in. Um, Jack and Leona moved in to the homestead in 1889. So this house is actually down at Heritage Village now. This is the traditional homestead. Uh, back in 1889 and um, by 1891 their first son uh, Carl was born uh, three years later uh, their daughter Pearl uh, followed and um, unfortunately with Carl um, Carl and Pearl um, actually uh, passed away um, Carl died at 12 of uh, pancreatitis and Pearl died of a bowel obstruction uh, she was only three um, so um, while they you know, had all of this, you know, really great work. Um, they, they definitely were no strangers to, um, to sadness and, and to, uh, and, and to just, um, you know, bad things happening. Um, by 1895, uh, Jack was raising a rig neck, neck pheasants as, uh, he often heard his dad mentioned, it was just a beautiful game bird. And Jack thought if, if I raised pheasants, well, you know what, maybe I'll be able to pay the world back, um, you know, with some birds that uh, I shot in my younger days. And uh, although it, the ringneck pheasant actually isn't a local or, a, or a, a native bird to Ontario, it actually became successful. And um, no one in that time period uh, shipped birds to the U.S. Um, 
ship these birds to the U.S. for uh, propagation purposes more than any Canadian than Jack Miner. Um, in 1897, um, Manley, their son was born. Uh, Manley was named after Jack's brother-in-law. Um, again, tragedy again struck the Miner family in 1898, where Jack's close brother, Ted, uh, was killed in a hunting accident. And um, that's one of the, the great stories of Jack, how um, it was actually Jack's brother-in-law, Manly, who accidentally killed Ted in a hunting accident. And Jack actually carried Ted um, seven full miles through the bush up in Quebec, where they were hunt they while where they were sport hunting and uh, was able to bring Ted back to uh, their their campsite, but unfortunately, uh, it, it it was too late. Um, and then, uh, in honor of his brother uh, Ted, um, in nineteen hundred, Jack and Leona welcomed a son named Ted. And um, but in between those those two years, um, the business due to um, his brother's passing, um, the Miner family uh, kiln actually had a um, had a downturn, and actually one of the the people that were on the hunting trip owned a, a large business up in the, the uh, Huron uh, County area now and um, he had he had put in an, an order as a way to thank Jack and that there was a check for four thousand dollars for uh, for tile and it was the largest check that he had ever seen and Jack actually credited this man um, you know for essentially saving not only his business but uh, but, but himself. And then um, essentially from there, um, I'll, I'll briefly touch on uh, religion. As folks know, or folks may know, um, Jack was um, was a religious man. Um, he was illiterate until he was 30. And um, what had happened is that um, Jack ended up teaching a Sunday school class, even though he couldn't read. And what... what um, and how he actually learned to read was the the kids in the in the Sunday school classes would would read him passages in the Bible, and he would take those biblical passages, and and uh, you know passages that the kids liked, and then figure out a way again going back to those linkages to um, to you know relate it back to nature and discovery. So the Sunday school classes quickly became um, more of a lecture series where Jack would talk. And and you know the kids would have a discussion about about different verses, and uh, Jack would figure out a way to really relate it back to uh, to to nature, and again creating those those overall linkages. Um, it actually became so popular that um, the kids from the class would um, you know would would come and visit Jack, and would visit Leona, and Jack would end up taking the whole class out into the uh, into the woods to observe. They would observe the creatures that inhabit it. Jack would spend hours there as a kid and uh, throughout all of his adult life watching birds, watching the animals interact, watching how they move. And um, and that really, you know, the forests and the creeks, uh, those were his classrooms. And um, in terms of, you know, switching focuses from brick making into, you know, the, the sanctuary by, by 1904, um, Jack, you know, again, he was a full-blown conservationist at this time, understood that, um, there really is, is issues here, um, specifically, he wouldn't know it now because there's, they're everywhere, but the population of the Canadian goose in the early 1900s actually was quite low. Um, the Canadian goose and the mallard duck were actually close to extinction and, um, they were very rarely seen. And so Jack took it upon himself. And again, because of the conditions of the land, because they were already digging for uh, for these tiles, um, they had um, the ability to to build a pond. So in, in, in 04, that the, the main viewing pond was built. And then um, Jack waited. Um, his idea was to buy a few tame ducks, put them in, in the hopes to um, to really see if he could attract birds um to see what he could do um and um he waited so throughout 1905 06 07 08 nothing no wild birds and in uh in by 1909 um the first uh the first ducks came and the first duck he took is this little duck that he he named katie and um because at this time he's a full-blown conservationist and jack had this theory he had this wild idea 
that um, that birds migrated. Um, before Jack, there was never a there was never really a uh, you know the study of bird migrations, where they go, what they do. That was never really done. So what he did with this duck is uh, he put a little aluminum band on it. You know, it's about this big, uh, wrapped it around um, the, the leg of the duck, let it go. Well, uh, he was pretty shocked that uh, the next year uh, Katie came back. So I thought, holy crap, I have to I have to put a couple more of these bands on. So he, he put them on, let it go. And then um, the next round of ducks, he uh, he let go. Um you know, nothing really happened. And then about another year later, so this is about 1910, um, he received a letter from this gentleman, Dr. Anderson, down in uh, South Carolina. And it was this this full two-page letter, and we actually have it at the sanctuary. Um, but it um, again, I'm very much updating the language and paraphrasing here. Um, however, the, um, the letter essentially said, hey, Mr. Miner, here's your metal band back. I'm sorry I shot your duck. So that was kind of the aha moment for Jack in the sense that, um, holy crap, I'm, I'm kind of right. Um, birds do migrate. And, you know, this gentleman let me know of, of this. Maybe there will be more people that will let me know. Um, okay, I need to ban more, more, more ducks. And okay, I can actually ban geese. Okay, look, what else can I do? So, so this was really when you know, the, the origins of the sanctuary took off and, um, throughout the 1910s, 20s and 30s, um, the sanctuary quickly became the second busiest, um, uh, tourist attraction in Ontario, um, next to Niagara Falls. And, um, from there in Jack's lifetime, um, he banded over a hundred thousand birds. That's a combination of geese and, and ducks, um, National Wildlife Week. There's a week in, uh, Canada in April that um, recognizes, you know, being outdoors and being in, outside in nature. Um, it's actually in honor of Jack. So that's something that uh, every year that we we celebrate. And um, I look at it where this this is a gentleman, he was conservation before it was cool to be into conservation. And um, as a pioneer in his field, he attracted a number of uh really cool people. He has a, he's had a great friendship with uh, the baseball star Ty Cobb. Um, in fact, um, throughout the most of the night, most of the 20th century, uh, for the longest time, uh, the Jack Minor Sanctuary was the only place where you could play baseball. Um, because Jack, again, wanting to get the kids and wanting to get people outside, um, he built a baseball field. And on weekends, when Ty would come down to visit, um ty would have pick up uh baseball games with with the kids you know a, around the uh, the area and ty is even quoted as saying that outside of his baseball career and uh, i mean the guy had over 70 major league records uh his friendship with jack is something that uh you know was extremely cherished and then throughout the um throughout the 10s 20s 30s 40s jack jack hit hit the, the lecture circuit hard he spent about half of those years away um, lecturing people, talking to people, communicating his uh, his message of energy of environmental conservation, of really understanding the balances, trying to get people to understand the linkages between us as humans, and and making sure that we don't overwhelm our ecosystem, and uh, really trying to bring balance uh, to everything that we do. So, um, throughout the, the lifetime of the sanctuary, we've hosted six U.S. presidents, four prime ministers. Uh, Marilyn Monroe was a frequent guest in the 50s. Um, when I tell people the, the, this information, uh, their minds are kind of blown. And then they're quickly looking for proof. Well, send me a photo with Marilyn. And, and where do you have, you know, this and this and that and whatnot? Um, there actually isn't a photo of, of, uh, of Marilyn. Um, and the idea behind that is when you walk into the sanctuary and that's still, and that still is, is to this case, um, you're treated exactly the same. It doesn't matter if, if you're Marilyn Monroe or, or Tom Koch or Edward or, uh, Frank Down, you're treated like a human, you're treated, you know, you're treated with respect, with integrity, with, with honesty, and you're welcomed. No photos. Um, no big fuss. And it doesn't matter if you have a dollar in your bank account or a million. 
um, you're treated exactly the same. And, and those are the those are the traditions that Jack imparted on to everybody. And and those those are just one of the many ways that we you know continue his legacy today. Um, I do see your your question, Linda, which is great. Um, unfortunately, um, like it was back in Jack's day, how it is now. Um, the sanctuary gets no government support. Uh, there's no permanent funding from any level of municipal, provincial, or federal government. Um, the sanctuary relied primarily on, in Jack's day, it primarily relied on um, Jack touring Canada and the U.S. and taking speaking engagements. Um, they would sell tickets, and that revenue would would come back to to the sanctuary. Um, to help support um, operations and uh, and to and to fund um, those tasks, um, the sanctuary would also rely on donors. Um, one of Jack's uh, famous friends was Henry Ford. Henry actually provided the funding to uh, to make the original fence that we actually um, uh, renovated back in 2020 to make it look like the original fence that was put up uh, over uh, 100 years ago. So um, the sanctuary does not have any permanent funding. Uh, we rely on donors, on sponsors, on uh, you know writing grants and and trying to build and and develop these uh, these partnerships. So, um, and yeah, and essentially from there. So once Jack passed away in, in 1940 45, um, his wife Leona passed in 52, I believe. And then uh, Jack and Leona are actually buried on site. They're buried at the sanctuary. And um, Jack's son, Manly, and Jasper continued his legacy. Manly ran the administration. Um, Jasper um, ran the grounds, did the bird banding, uh, that sort of thing. And then the last minor family to have a role um, within um, the sanctuary was actually Jack's grandson, Kirk, uh, back in 2012. Um, however, I am proud to announced that uh, one of our newest board directors is uh, is actually a grandson of Manley's. So it's um, it's pretty neat that uh, we've reestablished that that connection. And and in terms of connections, um, I saw it on here, one of the slides talking about what is the Manley family or what is the minor family legacy? Um, to me, um, to me, it's Kingsville. Um, you look around, you go into downtown Kingsville, you stop at the Banded Goose and buy a case of Wild Jack Lager. You go to Jack's Gastro Pub. Um, you go golf at the Kingsville Golf Course and their keys have little geese keychains. Um, the minor family in the sanctuary, um, you know, played a pivotal role in establishing Kingsville, establishing Kingsville as a community, as a place for people to, to want to come, want to establish roots. And um, in my mind, that's exactly what the overall legacy is. And, um, you know, in, in those early years of, of establishing Kingsville, as establishing it, it as a community uh, within Essex County and, um, you know, moving forward, you know, we're, we're currently writing those pages of what that minor family and, and what uh, the sanctuary will mean, you know, for the environment, for our battle against climate change. And, um, you know, moving forward to help to bring um, balance and harmony to our ecosystems and to our planet. So one one question, Tom, which you just answered was uh, about if there was any descendants um, that played a role, a key role. And you're just mentioning that they're coming back around. So that is yeah. incredible. And that's awesome to know. Um, yeah. Another question was in 2004, it was the 100th anniversary. Was there any anything special that was done to celebrate? Um, yes, um, just like um, back in 2015, there was another that was another kind of a milestone period um, back in 04. Um, we did a uh, the sanctuary did a uh, a special 100 year bird ban that went on um, that went on these birds um, and uh, throughout National Wildlife Week um, it uh, you know it, it was a special week and we we really use National Wildlife Week as a kickoff to you know not only have a birthday party for Jack Jack's birthday is uh, is always during that week um, but again to just I, I believe there are old press clippings. Um, again, back in 2004, I was in my third year of university. So uh, that was a very long time ago for me. But um, but yeah, no, again, great question. And um, 
yeah for sure we, you know uh, the sanctuary did did that special band and um you know there would have been uh, press clippings um you know f f from from the you know local and and, uh, and area papers for sure okay uh, kind of going back more to the beginning now <clears throat> A question of did all 10 of uh, Jack's siblings end up migrating when they came to Canada or did any stay back? Do you know? I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it was very hard. Um, I spend so much time focusing on, you know, our operations at the sanctuary. I, I, I did what I could to find other deep dives, but when you get into the minor family tree and then, and you see all of the branches, it's a very big tree. And then you try to go to, to Leona side and that's even a bigger tree. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, okay, and maybe if that's I can, something we could look up then. Absolutely. That's, that's a task for us. <laughs> and, and and maybe and maybe I could provide just a quick kind of twenty second mm -hmm. uh, spiel about these bands. Um, what what these minor bands and why they're so beloved by the hunting community is um, there aren't many of them. And what I mean by that is um, every year the sanctuary um, bans anywhere from, you know, if it's a good banding year, we'll ban 1,000 to 1,100 birds. The last couple of years, we haven't been able to ban many because of the avian flu epidemic that that went that was going on. Um, this year, as a part of a goose relocation program with the city of Mississauga, we were actually able to ban 850. So... We're, we're getting these reports and they're done exactly the way they did in Jack's day where they would write them um, the band. Now people want to keep the band and what they do is they um, they send us an email. And um, so this year for the 2023 season, we banded 850 geese. So the delight that are on these hunters, um, I've seen grown men, um, you know, be reduced to tears because you know, they show me, they stop in and, hey, I'm from Tennessee. I came up on a hunt. I wanted to come here. I've heard about this place since my great grandfather who took me hunting, who taught me hunting. And and so there's that tradition there with, with the hunter and, and the fact that they get this little piece. A goose band is about this big and it brings them such delight in order to to have this keepsake. It, it means the world to them. Um, and it, it means that way simply because um, there aren't many of them and, um, I get calls all the time. Hey, if you really want to help your funding, I'll give you $5,000 if you make me a, an original band. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't because it just dilutes the, um, it, it just, it, it dilutes that brand. And that's something that we're, we're not interested in. Um, great question. Um, and I actually will give a confession to everybody before I started working at the sanctuary and I've only been there since July of 2022, I didn't like birds. Birds kind of freaked me out. I didn't understand them. And um, I absolutely love them now. Um, the Canadian geese, especially um, it is, they are a beautiful creature. Um, they're a vastly misunderstood creature. Um, is it hard to ban a wild bird? It really isn't. Um, you, you do need a team. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anybody, even our ground superintendent, Joe, who I would imagine in Joe's life, he's probably banded, I would say close to 40,000 birds. Um, he's an expert in the field. Um, he was trained by Jack's son, Jasper, um, to, to ban a, a bird alone, um, to actually coordinate the gathering of them. You know, you do need you know, two to three people. Um, however, once you're able to pick them up, the process is it's just such down to a science where once they're in the handler's hand, um, the bands are all pre-made. We still make them the original way Jack did. Could we automate it? Sure. Um, but that's another thing that makes them special is everything is hand punched with the hammer and the punch. And, um, you know, the whole process, once the the, bit, the bird is in our hands. Um, it's anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, the leg is up, the band goes on, on the bird. Uh, the bird is, is uh, sexed, whether it's a male or female, you know, the, the number's written down, the birds, the bird goes back and then it's, uh, and it's full, fully, uh, 
you know, with the concern uh, and the appreciation of the bird, because we want to keep that time limited so that they can go off and, and, and do their thing. So, but excellent question. Um, what would you say would be your favorite artifact, art, artifact, artifact um, in the museum or in the uh, the minor house? We have a number of really cool artifacts. Um, and what I want to do tonight as well is for everybody that uh, joined here, um, if you're interested, send me an email because I'd love to give you guys a complimentary tour just for uh, tolerating me for, for these last few minutes. Um, I'd be happy to show you guys off, uh, show you guys the grounds in person. Um, I have a number of really uh, kind of favorites. Uh, we have a couple signed Ty Cobb baseballs, which I'm I'm a sports guy, so it's pretty cool to see um, to see that. And actually, Linda, with your question, um, the email is on the website. You can email our generic email is uh, questions at jackminer.com. So super easy. It's questions at jackminer.com. So um, we have a couple. Uh, um, we have a couple of Ty Cobb baseballs. We have a letter that um, Henry Ford was given to um, Jack. Jack, um, you know, received this letter, and it was actually from um, a fellow Ohioan, uh, Thomas Edison. So it's pretty cool to see this letter from the desk of Thomas Edison, and to see Edison's handwriting. Um, that's again very cool. Um, we have Jack's, um, we have Jack's order of the British empire. That was, a, that was a, an award that, um, that, that the King of England gave, um, Jack back in the 19, I think it was about 1918 or 1919. And that order of the British empire actually predates it's our now order of Canada. Um, and so we have that medal on display as well. Um, we have a number of pictures. We even have the original band that Mr. Anderson provided um, that he gave back to Jack. And we have that letter still uh, still preserved. Uh, one thing from a historian standpoint, and while I say I'm not a historian, my background in education is actually history. I have a history degree from the University of Windsor. So what I pride myself on as an executive director is many things. But when you come and view the house, um, and the minor family house uh, was built in 1919. Um, Jack's son uh, Manley lived there, and then Manley's son Kirk lived there, and Kirk lived there up until 2012. So we now have uh, the house is, is for uh, view as well. But what I pride myself on the house is, um, you know, you'll see couches, you'll see chairs, you'll see tables, the tablecloths, the cups, the saucers, the forks, the knives. Um, those are all items from the miners themselves um this isn't something that the foundation bought and oh that looks from 1920s um these are all items that um you know when you're having a dinner party at leona's um you that's what you ate on and um i know this because one one really cool story a couple weeks um into my into my first month at jack minor is about five to five and i'm getting ready to leave for the day and i have somebody walk into the museum so my wife had got to the point now where she's like, I expect you home whenever you're home. I know that people pop in and, and you want to make an impression, obviously. And um, this, this lady came in and she walked around and checked things over. And she's like, I probably can't go in the house, can I? And I'm like, well, you know, if you want to book a tour, you can book a tour. These are kind of the different ways. And she goes, oh, I was hoping to see it now. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, Manley's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm Manley's great granddaughter. Like, let's go. Sorry, she was Manley's granddaughter. So she was um, Jack's great granddaughter. So she grew up, basically grew up in that house and every weekend was there, you know, visiting Grandpa Manley. And uh, so she was able, so I, I walked her in and, and, you know, I, I gave her the tour and just, I, it was one of those moments where um, it was pretty special because um, she was the one giving me the tour and she's like, oh, you still have the cups. You still have the saucers. Oh, look at you. You didn't get rid of the built-ins. I love that you kept the built-ins and, and literally walked it, you know, and she, she said she was 53 and it was the first time since she was 12 when she was in that place. So that was a pretty special moment and uh, a really cool thing to, to be a part of. So. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Never know who's going to walk through that door, right? Exactly. Um, oh, another amusing story. I, I had a, a gentleman from Tennessee um, call me and 
And the neat thing is, is I've, I've literally had calls from, I think I'm, I'm only missing Hawaii, but I've had calls from all of the States and Hey, I'm so-and-so I live in Nevada. Hey, I'm so-and-so I live in New Mexico. Um, you know, the border's open now, you know, I grew up as a waterfowl hunter. I want to come up. Um, but I had this one gentleman in Tennessee who uh, shot a minor, a minor banded bird. And so I, I'm get, trying to get his information and he wasn't the most computer savvy. And, and so I asked for his name, I asked where he, sh you know, you know, the particulars. And when it came to where did you shoot the bird? And I was looking for the specific town because then that information is, is taken and, and it's put over a map so that every year we can actually, um, you know, we can actually develop that, inf that that data to show where, you know, the bird, the birds ended up. And uh, when it came to, well, where did you shoot this bird person? Or where did you shoot this bird? And he goes, well, I shot him in the head in a very rich, thick Tennessean accent that uh, definitely stands out. And um, I can definitely hear it. So. Um, Peggy had sent me a message directly. So I just, I just copied it so you can read it. So she's just saying, thank you so much. Perfect. Um, great comment, Peggy, and I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad I, I wasn't too boring for you. Um, I, I, one one thing to know, and why you would have heard about Jack so often is, um, and I equate this to where like back in my in migration season, because you know the sanctuary openly is is trying to recruit and get as many birds in here as possible. So the fields are cut right down and we actually the secret is is they actually drop large volumes of corn out so we're looking to feed these birds and when you grew up with somebody like you grew up in the 40s and 50s up in in huron county so your parents grew up in a time where they wouldn't have seen many canadian geese or many mallard ducks or many wood ducks or black ducks um so the fact that you could go to some place that wasn't too far away um and come during a migration season and be able to see these rare birds but not only not in but not to see one or two of them but to see 60 70 80 thousand of them just cover a field um you know it i can only imagine what that would have been like um to to just see and experience and um yeah we we have photos of the sanctuary out front on on road three west there of just cars back to back to back to back to back all the way down just waiting to come in waiting to um you know experience it to to be able to come to a place that uh, and any more too with with the way things are with how things are so costly and the way prices are out of control um there aren't too many places anymore you can go and bring a family bring loved ones um, we have our learning center, which is actually our old repurposed clubhouse. It's the base of operations where Jack ran the foundation. That's a place now where kids can go in and um, pick up pine cones and learn about soil and water and, and actually get them thinking about the environment. And it's at no cost. And and the reason why it's no cost is, is we're not a zoo. Jack never intended us to be a zoo. There's no gatekeeper it, um, we want to give people an opportunity to, to come, to learn, to participate and, and to be. And there's a place to just put your phone away and to just be outside, be outdoors. Together that with our, our Kennedy Woods trails, we have just over five kilometers of, of walking and hiking trails. And it's a great place to, to bring your family, you know, to bring your loved ones and to, you know, ex experience the wonder. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I think Linda um, is ready to wrap it up. Uh, I don't okay, see any perfect. more questions. I don't see any more questions. So that that was great. Linda, do you want to pop on? Sure. Um, I was just thinking that uh, I'd like to at least show the, okay, I did something wrong there. I'm sorry. That's okay. You're I gotta, forgiven. I got to get back to the, <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. Um, I wanted to show the video that is in yes. the history section of your website. The website is fabulous. It shows all okay. kinds of information about all the different stations there are. I was yep. just blown away by by the website because Thank you. having been there um, 40, 
50 some years ago it's mm -hmm. quite uh it's quite changed it's it just looks beautiful and i do want to just see if i can share this let's see um can you see that yep, yep. okay let me, let me we have traveled far towards a star the skies have we've roamed have led us home our wings are tired it's time to rest before we moved on to build our nest welcome to the jack minor migratory bird sanctuary founded by its namesake the legendary jack minor in 1904 for over 100 years it's been the home to hundreds of thousands of migrating geese and ducks and it is here that Jack banded his first mallard duck in 1909. Since then, well over 100,000 ducks and geese have been banded, carrying with them Jack Miner's legacy. Through his sold-out speeches on conservation and pollution, Jack became known as one of the world's greatest naturalists and the father of conservation in North America. He made many high-profile friendships along the way, one of the most notable being Ford Motor Company founder, Henry Ford. He also received several medals over the years, including an order of the British Empire from His Majesty King George VI. Once rated the second greatest tourist attraction in Canada, hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world have visited the Jack Minor Migratory Bird Sanctuary. And as we guide you through the house and grounds, you'll see why. As you make your way through Jack Miner's historic house, each doorway will reveal unique and intimate discoveries showcasing how Jack and his family lived. You'll even discover a bedroom reserved for his best friend and Major League Baseball star, Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb not only had a room in Jack Miner's house, but he also had a baseball field named in his honor, where the player himself came to play. Inside Jack's old carriage house, is the Jack Miner Museum, overflowing with the rich history of Jack himself and everything he did for his feathered friends. As you cross the grounds, you'll find the Stewart Playfair Stadium behind the viewing pond. It is here where many have gathered to hear the history of the grounds and watch the birds being banded. A short walk from here brings you to Jack's memorial and final resting place. Jack and his wife, Leona, were laid to rest on this piece of paradise they built and called home. Across the road, you'll find an expansive gazebo overlooking the wetlands where you can watch hundreds of geese being fed during their migration. The woods were Jack's classroom and his true passion. That's why we encourage our guests to spend a day exploring the six kilometer long Kennedy Woods trails, complete with picnic grounds and rest areas. By banding together the past and present, the future will undoubtedly bring new light and life to the Jack Minor Migratory Bird Sanctuary. With your help, the necessary upgrades can be made to the Kennedy Woods, including a larger outdoor eating area with a custom playground for children to enjoy, as well as an expansion to our current museum, which will place Jack Minor back on the map as a historical, family-friendly destination for all to enjoy. Our time has come. We've had our rest. You shared your home. You did your best. You gave us food. You kept us safe. For there is not a greater place. Visit jackminer.ca to find out how you can assist in bringing something even more extraordinary to these historical grounds. Jack Minor Migratory Bird Sanctuary. Land here. Well, with that, I do want to thank Tom for the the great talk that he gave us, not only about the Minor family. I was really surprised. I did not know his wife was Leona Weigel. And of course, uh, we all have seen tons and tons of uh, mm -hmm. family trees done for, for the Weigel family. Mm -hmm. um, everything has been very interesting. Uh, and it, it does remind us that Fall is the prime time to take a visit to this fascinating and famous migratory bird reserve. So we do encourage people to check out the Jack Miner webpage, jackminer.ca, 
to see the various stations offered at the sanctuary. And join us again in October when we'll learn a little more about the town of Essex and have a happy Thanksgiving with your family. And Tom, did you have any last words you want to say before we sign off? I just want to say thank you, Linda. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for everybody that, that took the time to come out. Um, I appreciate I appreciate you guys for asking me. Um, it's an honor to um, to have um, met you guys tonight. And again, I, I, I wish uh, everybody... Um, you know, a successful the rest of 2023, feel free to uh, email me at questions, questions at jackminer.com. Uh, if you want to come out and, uh, and meet me in person, I'd be happy to, uh, to show you guys uh, around our grounds. Well, that sounds great. And I do want to wish everybody uh, a happy Thanksgiving that I hope you share with your family and a good night to everyone. See you in a month. Bye for now.